High Tech with Corey K. Weekly here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. From the world of computers to the ever popular computerized gadgetry that are becoming part of our everyday life and living and society. From kids and their gaming devices, teens and their smartphones to the applications of personal and business computers. From hardware to software, from standalone units to network computers. Join high tech guru Corey K. Weekly right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network as he takes on the topics that will be of use and great value to the international audience of the Exxon Broadcast Network. High Tech with Corey K. Weekends at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I am your host. I am your guy. As together we cross the time-space continuum this, to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 11 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. Right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our family of broadcast affiliates, right around this great big world of ours on the Exxon Broadcast Network. If you'd like to send an email, studio at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our main radio website where you can find out all about the Exxon, what we've done in the past, what we're doing in the future, and where we intend on taking this great phenomenon that is, that is just taking in the entire world, the Exxon, um, this has been a great 25 years. We're now in our 26th year, Exo Nation, thanks to you. My first guest tonight is Louis Rosenberg. He is CEO of Unanimous AI, a Silicon Valley company he founded to pursue his interest in collective intelligence and human-computer interaction. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg attended Stanford University, where he earned his bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees. His doctoral was focused on robotics, virtual reality, and human-computer interaction. While working as a graduate researcher at the U.S. Air Force um, Armstrong Lab in the early 1990s, Dr. Rosenberg created Virtual Fixtures, the first immersive augmented reality system ever built. 
Dr. Rosenberg has also worked as a tenured professor at California State University. And uh, Dr. Rosenberg's current interest is artificial swarm intelligence, a method by which groups of people can form real-time swarms online and think together as a hive mind. Joining me now is Dr. Rosenberg. And, Doctor, welcome to the X-Zone. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, are, are we getting that much closer to the combining of computers and humans into an artificial intelligence that is going to be replacing humans? I think there's a lot of technologies that are advancing in parallel on, on this front. So there's, there's a lot of effort in what, what I would call pure artificial intelligence research where uh, most companies are and researchers are working to build devices mm -hmm. that um, completely replace human thinking. Right. And then there's other other paths where we're working to um, instead of replace human thinking, amplify human thinking. And that's that's uh, more the area that that I'm interested in because I I would prefer to keep people in the loop as opposed mm -hmm. to just completely replacing people with, uh, with technology. Why do you think there are people out there, doctor, who actually have the fear that the computers are going to overtake the world and we will be the slaves to the computers? I, I think the fear is justified because the technology is advancing quickly mm -hmm. in, in the world of artificial intelligence, and these technologies have the capacity to uh, to grow faster and quicker uh, than than we than we can possibly imagine. And so, if you have uh, if you have a technology that achieves a level of intelligence that starts to match our own or even exceed our own, the problem there is that once once an artificial intelligence is smarter than us, yeah. it has it has no reason to uh, it has no reason to need us anymore. And so its values, its interests, its, mm -hmm. uh, its motivations will be its own, and that basically becomes the most dangerous technology that, that we can create, one that's smarter than us, is able to advance itself, uh, since we built it, it's smarter than us, it can make itself smarter, and... It ha we have no reason to believe that, that its interests will be the same as our interests. Is there any body, governing body, that would actually protect humans against uh, from being overcome by computers and actually working for the computers? And you know, Or is this just something that is found in Hollywood and uh, sci-fi films? <laughs> there, there is no, uh, there is no oversight. No, I... uh, there are. Uh, there's no oversight on artificial intelligence research. There's, you know, there's a lot of discussions mm -hmm. from uh, from various groups who believe that there should be controls put in place. Uh, the problem is that there really has, is no example of a technology where people have have put controls in place. Once once people figure out how to do something. They do it, and and I think even if even if people were mm -hmm. were saying that they should put limitations on artificial intelligence research, it's kind of unrealistic that uh, that those limitations will will stop it from happening anywhere in the world. I mean, what would happen is if if there were limitations in one country, researchers would just go to another country. They will find a place where where they will do the work, and uh, and so I don't know that that uh, regulation is going to be the thing that stops artificial intelligence from becoming dangerous. What will? That's a great question. I mean, my, my, my area of interest is what I call art, artificial swarm intelligence. And this is a, a really a different process where instead of building an intelligence from scratch, we are amplifying human intelligence by connecting people okay. online. Allowing, allowing people to think together. And, and the reason, and we can talk about how that works, but the reason that, that I'm interested in that area is that it keeps people in the loop. And so when we build an intelligence that is uh, basically a, a brain of brains, uh, of an intelligence that's a group of people 
syncing together, it's still built on people. It still inherently has human interests, human values, human motivations, um, human objectives, and basic sensibilities built into the process. And so my view is that the way that humans stay ahead of the machines is by by thinking together, amplifying our intelligence, and staying one step ahead of of AI, pure AI technology by uh, by by building these these mm-hmm. global these global networks. So, how would your um, artificial swarm intelligence actually work, Doctor? Right. So uh, the way the way our system currently works is that we allow groups of people to uh, to log in online from anywhere in the world, and they can work together to answer questions mm-hmm. and and make predictions and make estimations and and uh, come up with ideas by thinking together. And it's modeled after the way nature builds intelligence. And so it's it's worth taking a step back and saying. In, you know, when artificial intelligence research started in the 1950s, what scientists did was they, they looked to nature and they said, well, yes. how does nature build intelligence? And they looked to the most familiar thing, which is our own brain, mm-hmm. and they said, oh, well, the way we build intelligence is we have networks of neurons, and let's, let's simulate that. Let's, right. let's build that from scratch with neural networks. Mm-hmm. The thing is, nature actually has another way that it builds intelligence. It builds intelligence by creating systems of, of individuals. This is why uh, birds form flocks and fish form schools and bees form swarms because those organisms, when they work together in a system, they, they actually can make better decisions together. They become smarter together. Well, don't we actually and see so that? What, don't we actually see that now, Doctor? When we see cities, when we see farming communities, when we see what is going on on the internet right now with with the different uh, fa- uh, like Facebook, Twitter, different websites, isn't this already been developed? So there is. We we as humans are building the infrastructure to connect ourselves, mm-hmm. but we haven't connected ourselves in in these real-time systems. And so, you know, right now we have the ability to to look a little bit at the collective intelligence of groups. Things like Facebook and Twitter, uh, we can look at, you know, if, if, if you look at something that gets upvoted or, or liked on, on Facebook, yeah. it is reflecting the collective intelligence of a population, but it's, it's a very minor amplification of intelligence. And uh, all right, so tell me. We look to, all right, so tell me how the swarm yep. intelligence would be different from we all, what we already have now, because there are television uh, programs that get the viewer uh, involved by voting. American Idol would be yep. the the best example that I can give right now. Uh, we have television programs that we produce here that require. Uh, people who are watching, people who are listening to actively, you know, take part in the program itself. So what's different? Right. So what you're talking about is uh, basically a, a vote or a poll, which is the way people have been tapping the collective intelligence of groups for about 100 years. And, and there is a minor amplification of mm-hmm. intelligence. What, what we've been doing is, is comparing exactly that, votes and polls, to, to swarms. And a swarm is where, you know, when, you, when you take a vote or a poll, each person is, is functioning independent of everybody else. When you cast your vote, it doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. You're casting your vote as your own individual, and you're just sending it off, uh, and you hope that it gets tallied. Uh, and and, the, and you're part of the majority. In a in a swarm, everybody's working together in in real time. How? There, it's basically. So when you so, the best way to to explain it, or one way to think about it, is um, we have uh, we have an interface online that people log into, and and some people say it, it reminds them in a sense almost of a of a massive online Ouija board. Because what happens is you, you ask a question, and there's a, there's a, a puck, a glass puck, and, mm-hmm. and everyone who logs in 
is working together in, in real time to be hundreds of people from all over the world, and they're, they're moving that puck together to the answer. And they're literally pushing and pulling together, finding the solution that, that optimizes their collective satisfaction and their collective confidence. Why, in, and so instead, instead of... of them, Okay, uh, uh, let's just take one step at a time, Professor, uh, for Doctor. For example, on, on the site when you log in, you say there's a puck. So what does the puck to go to every, alpha, uh, every letter of the alphabet to come up with an answer? So it doesn't... It doesn't <coughs> we don't do it letter by letter. We do it uh, by options. Okay. So, if, um, so let me give you an example, a real sure. example. Uh, so a real example, uh, we've been doing lots of predictions and comparing those predictions against against polls and also against experts. And so uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, Newsweek challenged us to predict the Oscars. Mm-hmm. And so we said, okay, well, we'll get a swarm of 50 movie fans, um, you know, just regular people who are interested in movies, and we'll have them get together online, and we will ask them who, you know, who will win Best Picture, who will win Best Actress. And and they have the options appear on the screen, right. and there's this glass puck, and they're collectively, you know, 50 people working together and moving the puck to an answer. Now, when what we do is first we add, before before we have them work together as form, mm-hmm. we we ask them to to just fill out a survey and tell us individually who they think is going to win. So we have a kind of a baseline, and so out of these 50 people. On average, they were forty-four percent accurate when they when they predicted the Oscars as individuals. Now but, that doesn't sound very good, forty-four percent, but it's it's actually predicting the Oscars is really hard. All right, but didn't you say you about, didn't at, you say before that this is much better than and bigger than taking a poll? And the first thing you do is take a yeah, poll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so we take taking a poll just so that we can see what we can compare it to a poll. So we take a poll just to see what the, we take a poll, which gives us the sense of how would the individuals have done on a poll. And they were 44% accurate. Mm -hmm. And then we can compare that to, to, um, to the swarm. And so when they work together as a swarm, these same exact 50 people who were 44% accurate as a swarm became 76% accurate when they work together as a swarm. And so, what what you see is this really large amplification of intelligence where a poll gives you this kind of baseline level of of response mm-hmm. but when they're working together as a system when there's feedback loops and they're pushing and pulling on each other and they're finding the answer that that optimizes their satisfaction they were 76% accurate and what's fascinating about that that you can also look at movie critics, and the average movie critic in America was 66% accurate. And so what you, what you see was this group of people, 50 people, who were 44% accurate alone, mm-hmm. when they worked together as a swarm, actually became more accurate than the experts. They, they, they functioned at a level together when they were basically a brain of brains that that beat almost every expert movie critic. All right, so let me and get the, let me let me get this straight. So what you do is you take a poll yep. from each of the participants. There were fifty participants, right? You take the poll from each one of these participants to get your baseline. Right. For uh, based just on the you compare. Okay, just all right. So based on the poll that was taken by each, the percentage was forty four percent accurate. Then using the swarm intelligence where they were actually working together, they were able to increase that to 76% accuracy. Exactly, exactly. All right, so, so no, just, no, no, just a sec here, just a sec. Okay. Whoa, slow down here. Uh-huh. So basically, what you're doing is using a computer to have a telephone conference call. <laughs> In a sense, we're, we're having a computer to allow a group of people who uh-huh. are spread all around the world yeah, but, but to work together. I understand that. I understand that. But what, isn't this basically what you can do with teleconferencing? Get a group of people well, from, they're around, not, they're, from around they're the not, world? They're not arguing. They're well, not arguing with each other. They're not talking to each other. They're not arguing with each other. So what are you they doing are, taking out the community? What are you doing taking out the, the actual aspect of vocal communication by just replacing it with artificial intelligence? 
what we're doing is we're allowing them to physically move this puck. And mm-hmm. again, think of, just imagine a Ouija board for a second. Yeah. Like a real Ouija board. Mm-hmm. A real Ouija board, you could have five or six people sitting around a table and they're all touching this, this planchette yeah. and they're moving it together mm-hmm. to, to an answer. Well, what we have is 50 people or 100 people or 150 mm-hmm. people all around the world yeah. doing this, doing something similar. They're, okay. they're all using their, they're either using their mouse or their touch screen, and they're uh-huh. working together in real time to move this little this puck brass to, puck to an answer. Okay. A little brass puck to an answer. Okay. And, and the motion mm-hmm. is, is the collective input of all these people together with our algorithms in, in the background that, that combine yeah. all of their different pushes and pulls and allows this puck to reach to reach an answer that mm-hmm. reflects their their collective knowledge and wisdom and intuition. And in in every case what we see is that when the group works together as a system this way, they amplify their intelligence compared to working alone or or taking a poll. And very often they they perform better than than experts, even if it's a group of of novices. So I can give you a, let me give you another example. No, let, even, I've got to take a I've got create, I've got okay. to take I've got to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. We'll be okay. back uh, in a couple of minutes. Exxon Nation, Doctor Louis Rosenberg is our special guest. We're talking about artificial swarm intelligence. And when we come back, I'll take some of your comments because this is very interesting. Talking about artificial intel, uh, swarm intelligence. If you'd like to get more information, www.unu.ai. That's unu.ai. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Whatever you do, don't go away. I'll be back after the short break. to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 program Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fuck surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com.
While science pursues fact, magic accesses a quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. Dr. Lewis Rosenberg is our special guest. We're talking about Swarm Artificial Intelligence. His website is www. You ready for this? U-N-U dot A-I. Uh, all right, so I, I'm, I, over, the, over the little break we took here, I, I was going through my notes, and... Here you've got 50 people who go to a designated website on a specific topic. You pre um, you, you 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 get your baseline by asking them a number of questions, I guess, and taking a survey. This information is fed into your system, and then the participants go to a designated website and take a brass ring, much like you would do in the use of a Ouija board. And push this little brass way, ring to the direction based on the number of the people who want the brass, I'm sorry, brass puck to go to. Is that correct? Right. So um, they, they are they're moving the puck together. Mm -hmm. Each person is controlling, uh, is providing their input using their mouse or a touch screen. Yeah. Uh, to basically push on the on the puck, yeah. But they're 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 all doing it together. They're pushing and pulling and finding the direction of the puck mm -hmm. that uh, that they can all agree upon. And it ends up being a, a very different answer than if you just took took a poll. Because if you take a poll, everyone gets gets to voice you know one one opinion in isolation. Mm -hmm. When when the group is working together as a system, there's, there's feedback loops. So as, as people see the puck moving in one direction, they react to that. People change their opinion. They, they might be uh, in favor of one option, but they see that it's not going to go there. So they, they switch their opinion. They might start defending against uh, one of the options. And so if you have 50 people or 100 people or 500 people mm -hmm. all reacting in real time, they're, they're working the way a swarm does in nature. And in fact, the, the algorithms that, that allow the group to work together to control the puck are, are based very much on how natural swarms work, especially honeybee swarms. All right, so, okay, I understand, I understand that, but let me, let me just get two questions in here. Based, sure. based on your research and based on the work that has done, been done with the swarms, you've come to the conclusion that polling is, does not reflect the group 
consciousness or the or the swarm uh, opinion. Am I correct? That is correct. So a poll so, will tell you what the mm-hmm. most po- a poll will tell you what the most popular answer is. Right. But it's not necessarily the answer that the group that the group would agree upon. Okay. So, so so let uh, me take really, l- let me take the question to the next step. I you know this is the second part of the question. Uh huh. So if polls do really do not really give the uh, the the consensus of the entire swarm. Looking at the United States of America or any country that has elections that use polls, are you telling me that the polls or the elections do not reflect the consensus of the majority of those who, uh, who voted? For example, if, if uh, the color green is to be voted on, the color red is to be voted on, the color blue is to be voted on, all these people go to the poll, they select their their candidate. Let's say Green wins based on the number of votes casted, and a vote is nothing else but a poll. That's why they're called polling stations. This is uh, the incorrect response of the people? That is right. It, it, especially if you have more than two choices. If there's three choices, three colors, four colors, five colors, if there's more than two choices, the result is usually not the choice that would, that, that would best satisfy the group. All and, right. If that, uh, if, a, a way to really. Mm-hmm. If that is the case, how come this is, you, this is the system that has been used for years, but for electing, <laughs> for, you know, for for electing presidents, electing prime ministers, you know, isn't it uh, yeah, isn't it the voice of the people instead of the voice of the computer? A, a, a vote in a, or a poll tells you the most popular choice, but it doesn't tell you the choice that the group would actually be most satisfied with. And let me give you a really simple example that, that makes this clear. Okay. Let's say we were gonna let's say we were gonna ask a group of people, six people, where should we go for dinner? Mm-hmm. And that's a tough choice for a group of six people. And and in fact I could say, where should we go for dinner? And and all six people could could make a suggestion. And somebody says Chinese food, Mexican food, Italian food, mm-hmm. Indian food and then I say, okay, let's take a vote. Yeah. Well, first thing that's going to happen is we might all just vote for the choice that, that we gave, in which case we, we don't know what the answer is, but let's just pretend that uh, we take the vote and two people voted for Indian food and one person voted for Mexican, one for Italian, and one for all the others. By, by looking at the majority, we say, well, the most votes went to Indian food, mm-hmm. but we're, we're going to Indian food. Now, that doesn't account for the fact that two of those people, three of those people, they just might hate Indian food, or maybe they went for, to Indian food for, for lunch, or maybe uh, they just don't feel like it right now. And so you're going to go to Indian food, but you might have a number of unhappy people, even though the, the largest majority voted for Indian food. Now, if you, if you do it as a swarm, it's a system. And so what happens is everyone starts pulling for their different options, and so Somebody's pulling on the puck trying to get it to go to Indian food. Somebody's pulling trying to get it to go to Mexican food. And if it starts out with two people pulling to Indian food and all the other people, all the other choices are split, the puck will start moving to Indian food. But it's a system, and so people react. And so now when people see the puck moving towards Indian food, that person who was pulling to Chinese food and just, just hates Indian food is going to change their strategy. They're going to change. They're going to stop pulling for Chinese food and say, "Well, maybe if I pull to Italian food, mm. uh, there's other people who will pull there as well." Or, or maybe somebody pulling for Chinese food just starts defending against Indian food, and so people start changing to find to find the solution that they that that they can best live with. And if you have instead of six people, it's six hundred people, and they're all adapting in real time. The the path of that puck is going to go to the solution. That might not be anybody's first choice. Well, let it me. Might, okay, but it, but it but it would be the choice that that the whole group would be the most happy with. And so maybe the group ends up going to Italian food, mm. and maybe it wasn't. It didn't have the most people who wanted to go to Italian food, but but the whole group is going to be the most happy <laughs> if they go to Italian food, which a, which a, a poll or a vote uh, just won't achieve for you. What happens if and if so you what, have what would happen if you had a various programmer? Who decided that they could actually rig the rig the system? And we've seen this happen. It does happen. 
You know, and what about the people who do not have internet? Don't they count? Right. Like, I, I, you see, <laughs> those, I, are both, those, those are both those are both good questions. So, uh, when you know when anything's happening online, you mm-hmm. certainly could, could wonder that uh, it could be manipulated. That's true, sure. poll or vote as well. So, uh, but anything that where the voice of people is going through electronics, it could be it could be tampered with. Um, and you are also correct that anything that requires you know internet connectivity mm-hmm. is you know potentially potentially excludes people. I mean, and and, are, and the, talking about talking about connectivity, what about the people who have uh, better bandwidth, who are using fiber optic, who are using uh, cable or satellite, compared to the people who have the home systems that they share with so many people on their block? Wouldn't their wouldn't their responses be slower, lagged, and therefore misinterpreted by the algorithms? Uh, that's a good. That's a good question. It's we we actually don't see that. We don't see the lag problems, uh, and the the issue we look at is mostly distance. So people have pretty fast connections, but if somebody you know we have groups where somebody's connected from San Francisco and somebody else is connected from mm-hmm. New Zealand. And if uh, if our servers are in the U.S., we, we look to see well are, are those people in New Zealand, you know, are they you know, are, is their system just as responsive? And it is. So we don't see the we don't see the lag problems, but certainly if somebody doesn't have connectivity, then they just they just can't use the system. Well, um, once once again, I'm I'm, our, try, I'm trying to see how this is so different from getting a group of people on a teleconference and having them hash it out instead of using a brass puck? What's the difference, really? Uh, so, that's a, great, that's a great question. So you can, uh, and we often think about um, looking at a group of people in a room, like in a focus group mm-hmm. or in a jury, which are, which are two good examples of, of that. And if you look at a lot of the... the social science research, both of focus groups and juries, what you find is that the people in the room tend to be greatly influenced by a, one or two people with strong personalities. And so we, we think that, that we're really getting the, the collective opinion of the group, of the whole jury, of the whole focus group, but really you have one or two people with a strong personality that ends up influencing everybody else. In a swarm, everybody's equal. Everybody has the same pull. Nobody can 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 over influence anybody else, and so you really get a, an honest and fair combination of the knowledge and interests and and intuition of of the group. And when you do that, you end up with you end up with a smarter a smarter result. Uh, let me give you another example that that. Uh, it kind of shows the the power of this. Sure, so, but before you do that, I, before you go to the next example, I just like to stick on uh-huh. this example, and you use the example of a jury or a focus group, which are two totally, totally different things. A jury is presented yeah. the facts. A focus group is based on the, a person's own personal opinions, and that's not what a jury is doing. A jury is using their their um, their ability to understand and to see the evidence that is being presented by a prosecutor or by a defense lawyer. They see the, the evidence. They hear witnesses. You know, it's, I, I don't think you can successfully put a jury in the same category as a focus group on the, for this example, sir. Uh, they are certainly very different. Uh, one is about... Uh, one is about uh, drawing out the opinion of a group, mm-hmm. and the other is trying to draw out the intelligence of a group. But in both cases, they're influenced by the particular personalities in the room, and uh, and particularly strong personalities overpower uh, weaker personalities. Sir, so the day I see a system like this being used in our judicial system, this is the time we shut America and Canada down and say we've lost it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you know the jury process is supposed to work. It's supposed to work, and um, and if people hash it out and they they stick by their principles, it it potentially 
can work. You see, what I see, um, what I see happening it. here is you're taking away the option of people discussing their points of view. All you're doing is you're pushing a little. You're, you're, in my opinion, you're giving the computer way too much authority. You're letting the people come onto a site, push this little puck around. Not, you know, you've got your algorithms running. You've got your little. Um, you know, options A or however you do it, but you're not giving the people to actually the the ability to discuss why they want to see a change, what they saw that makes them want to make a certain decision. For example, in a jury, have you ever been on a jury, sir? Uh, no. Okay. I'm an ex-cop. I'm very familiar with the judicial system and with law enforcement. In a jury room, you have 12 people who have the decision, the, the, the power to make a decision. During those times, many juries, especially when it comes to a sophisticated case, a homicide, um, heavy criminal activity, uh, they, they get, take the evidence at the end of the case and they go into a jury room where they sit, discuss, review, voice their opinions on why, let's say Sally believes the person should be guilty and Joe thinks he's innocent, gives them the opportunity of expressing why and bringing to light certain facts that other jurors may have forgotten or they bring new light to certain evidence. Can your system do this? So if, if people want to use the system that way, absolutely. So when people enter, enter the, the UNU platform, they, mm-hmm. they have the ability to chat with everybody else as well. So there's, there's standard, a standard text chat where people can discuss Why whatever are, okay. the issue is. Once again, we're getting into texting. Why not talking? Why do we so have... You could do that as well. The, so, with talk, so talking is great, and we have users who do that if it's a small group. If you have a group of of six or seven people, you can mm. they can talk. If you have fifty people, they really can't they can't communicate by speaking very well with fifty people. It, it becomes uh, unmanageable. Right. And if you have you know five five hundred people, it's even <laughs> it's, it's even crazy. I understand. But but the issue the issue that we look at is. If you have a group of people, whether it's, uh, and you take the jury example, and I fully agree with you that, that you know, the jury can spend time deliberating mm-hmm. and, and figuring out, uh, you know, pondering all the, the evidence, pondering all the issues, but at some point they're going to take a vote, right? right. They're going to take a vote to, dis- to see, and, and when they take a vote, they're going to, that vote will ultimately get them to an answer. Sometimes, and, and there, are, there are hung juries at times. Right. Uh, and and so the question is, mm-hmm. if they had, if they had the ability to do something other than take a vote that would better express the opinions of everyone sitting around the room, would they get to the right answer? That would they would they reduce the number of of erroneous convictions? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that that similar studies have been done with doctors. So doctors. You do something similar where they they consider a whole bunch of of medical evidence and they make a diagnosis. Right. And when and and they have the same issue, which is they're usually right, but there's mm-hmm. a certain number of uh, of you know false positives where they they make a diagnosis that's just wrong. And research has shown that if you if you have if you have a group if you have a group of doctors who actually combine their they're thinking together, mm-hmm. they will reduce the number of false positives by virtue of the, the collective intelligence of that group. And if they do it by a simple vote, it, does, it doesn't give them that much advantage. But if they do it more like a swarm, it gives them a, a bigger boost in intelligence. Now, they still very well might want to discuss and, and contemplate and point out their different points to each other. And, and I fully agree with you that those things are absolutely important for, for, for a jury or for uh, a medical team that's making uh, an assessment. Mm-hmm. But if, if the way they come to the conclusion at the end mm-hmm. is a vote, they're not, 
really tapping into the intelligence that's that's in the room as effectively as if, as if they do it as a system, as a swarm. And and I know it's easy to think about that as as technology getting in the way, but it's really actually it's really nature. And so and and I say that because over millions of years of evolution uh-huh. Nature has faced the same problem. They said, "Okay, we have we have these large groups of of animals, mm-hmm. you know, birds and bees and fish, and they have to make decisions together. And if it was the if the optimal way to do that was to take a vote, nature would have evolved a method for these animals to vote. But but it didn't. Nature evolved methods for these animals to form systems. Is it possible that, that humans that, have a better comprehension of things, and that's why we are able to vote?" that we maintain the right to vote, to express our opinion as individuals instead of as a swarm? So that's, I mean, the the issue isn't necessarily that we're taking away anyone's opinion. It's, and it's not even that we're, it is not even that we're, we're changing anyone's mm-hmm. opinion. It's just, it's just we're, a swarm is just a more efficient way of combining those opinions. How long does the finding, how long does the process of coming to a decision take when using your swarm technique? It's fast, and so if we ask a question, uh, a swarm generally comes to an answer in in under a minute. Uh, you know, once you know, and again, they might have to consider the details before, but but if you got to the point where you said, okay, uh, you know. Uh, who's going to win Best Picture? Mm-hmm. The swarm will come to an answer in in really twenty to sixty seconds, and that answer that they come to will be more accurate than if they took a vote, and um, and it'd be significantly more accurate. So, how would you recruit um, these people to to participate? For example, if you came to me with this proposition, I'd say no way. I don't want to take <laughs> part in that. It's against everything I believe in. Uh, so it's the, the thing is what people people find when they when they log into the system is that it's actually fun. It's fun for them to to log in and uh, and tap and just see what the the collective intelligence of the group believes about any question. And so people can log in. They can ask their own questions. Mm-hmm. They can they can ask questions about politics or fantasy football or uh, or really anything. And and then tap the collective intelligence of the group and and it's fun and it's also it's also fascinating because what you find is that these groups together make much better predictions and forecasts than they than they could do alone and so there there really is there really is truth to the fact that a group of people working together you know combining their intelligence in an efficient way becomes becomes smarter and makes uh makes remarkable predictions and forecasts that that often just beat the experts. Give me some examples of what has been accomplished using this system thus far. I mean besides the the uh, the academy. And by the way, do you remember earlier tonight uh, to, in this hour you were talking about the what was it six people deciding which restaurant to go to? Yep. You know, if if somebody doesn't like Indian food, you go to the restaurant and you, there's something on the menu that you'll like. You know, are, are we putting too much faith and too much trust in this? Like, I, I'm saying, well, what the hell? If you've got six people who need to go through all this just to decide what restaurant you want to go to, man, get a life. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not advocating using using this type of technology to decide on what restaurant to go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're going to make a if you're going to make a uh, a difficult forecast, it, it actually uh, it actually makes a big difference. And, and you know, one of the things that we we always look for are you know predictions that can be verified in a in a short amount of time because it's easy to predict the it's easy to predict the future and and nobody will remember uh, in in six months or five years if your prediction was correct. But, but how but how do you are, okay? So account for. The what if factor in life, like what if the person decides at the last second to turn left instead of going right? How do you how do you in, interject the human factor in this uh, swarm idea of yours? 
Right. So it all, so the swarm is not is the swarm is not clairvoyant. Mm-hmm. It is just making the best possible decision based on the information that the participants have. And so uh, here's a here's an interesting example. We were uh, we were challenged by a by a magazine to predict the Kentucky Derby, and um, and the Kentucky Derby and they and the porter said, hey, you know, don't just predict the winner. Predict the first four horses in order. And we didn't know anything about horse racing, so we just put you know put a comment out on the internet and mm-hmm. said, hey, anyone who's a horse racing enthusiast, you know, come in to the swarm and and predict the predict the Kentucky Derby. Right. And so they predicted the four horse of the Kentucky Derby, and the reporter uh, actually published the predictions in advance, which always puts pressure on us. Mm-hmm. But uh, because she did that, a lot of people actually bet the ticket, and and it won. <laughs> those those four horses. Came and it actually beat 540 to one odds, and so people who actually just bet twenty dollars on that ticket mm-hmm. won eleven thousand eight hundred dollars, and that's and that was a really interesting story. But the, to me, the more interesting thing is that we we always take this baseline, so we know well how did the individuals do, mm-hmm. and and it was twenty people who worked together to predict the Kentucky Derby. Not a single one of them, as individuals, predicted the the four horses correctly in order. And in fact, if you had just looked at the most popular choices as if it was a poll, they would have gotten just one horse right out of the first four. But when they worked together as a swarm, as a system, they got all four horses right in order and uh, and greatly defeated the odds. And and those are the type of results mm-hmm. that that we see again and again. All right, Doctor, and we've got to really say, we have to say so long for tonight. Our time has just run out. Exo Nation, uh, Doctor Lewis Rosenberg has been our guest this hour. And his website is www.unu.ai. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Broadcast Network.